Before I'll start talking about self-driving cars today, I'd like to get to know you as my audience a bit better. And I'll do that by asking you a few questions. So first of all, how many of you have ever driven using cruise control? Please raise your hand. Ah, oh, yeah, that's clearly most of you. Now, how many of you have ever driven using adaptive cruise control, or even better, a car that can drive itself on a highway, such as a Tesla? What? Well, a few. Okay, now, how many of you have ever driven a fully autonomous car? Okay, well, uh, one lucky girl. Great. But my point is that self-driving cars, it's, it's definitely a hot topic these days, but our experience with it is fairly limited still. And that's actually exactly what we're trying to change with the project I'm working on. My name is Koen Lekkerkerker, and I'm the chief engineer of this little thing, the WePod. And it's a self-driving people mover developed to move people around Ede and Wageningen. With this project, we're actually trying to push the boundaries of self-driving forward. And from what we've learned with this project, I would like to uh, tell you about the challenges involved in self-driving self and what the future may look like. But before we go into that, I think we should ask ourselves one very important question. And that is, why do we need self-driving cars in the first place? Well, there are plenty of reasons, and I can just mention a few now. First of all, things get much more efficient, leading to less pollution and less congestion. Secondly, it would be very convenient, obviously, because you don't waste time behind the steering wheel anymore. You can gain back all the time wasted on your daily commute. And third, we can increase traffic safety a lot. Every year, about a million people die from traffic accidents. 90% of traffic accidents are actually caused by human error. So, you could say that the least reliable part of a car is actually the human driver. Now, to fix that, we need to take the human out of the driving equation. But as it turns out, that's easier said than done. But I think overall we can agree that there's a lot to win here. But then we also need to address all the challenges involved before we can reap the benefits. And as you all noticed, media is uh, paying a lot of attention to this subject these days, and maybe it sometimes can come off a bit as a hype to you. And today I'll try to put that a bit more into perspective. Personally, I'm just a big nerd. I love everything about technology, especially uh, futuristic stuff like robots and self-driving cars. And I can talk for hours about writing codes, but unfortunately the organization didn't give me the time to do so. But I guess that's lucky for you. And luckily for you as well, self-driving is much more than just writing software. Actually, if there's one thing I've learned in this project, then it is that self-driving is as much about solving non-technical challenges as well as solving technical challenges. I would like to um, first have a short, show you a short glimpse of the uh, technical challenges involved and then a bit more depth, uh, I'll show a bit more depth, depth of the non-technical challenges. So the technical challenges actually come from two facts. First of all, our current traffic systems is designed for human drivers and not for computers. And secondly, we will need to mix self-driving cars with human-driven cars. If we only could change these two things, it would be so much easier. And actually, we have some experience with that already in the Netherlands. You might be familiar with these projects, the Rivian Park Shuttles and the Schiphol Park Shuttles. They drive autonomously on their own tracks, which are adapted to their needs, and it's isolated from other traffic. They have been successfully transporting thousands of people already for more than a decade. Now, unfortunately, making such a change on a national scale is simply impossible. So we'll need to take it step by step which means that we need to gradually upgrade our infrastructure to better suit the needs of self-driving cars, and we need to um, make self-driving cars more clever and more human-like. So what does that mean? That means that if you're driving your self-driving car, it should know that this do not enter sign does not apply to him, because it applies to the other lane. And this requires a level of contextual understanding. 
And contextual understanding is actually, from an engineering perspective, far from trivial to implement. Another example is that a car should uh, be able to read body language. So let's say I'm a pedestrian, I'm about to cross the street, you can tell from my attitude if I will cross or if I'll wait. These are subtle things and they're very difficult for a car to understand. Now let's go on with the non-technical challenges. And from those I want to highlight three. First of all, regulations, secondly, human distraction, and third, ethics. On the field of regulations, it will be needed. Uh, regulations will be needed to make sure that we can safely introduce self-driving cars into our world. That meant for our project WePods that we had to discuss with the Dutch road authorities to get us a permission to drive on public roads. This was actually pretty challenging at times, but we were breaking new grounds, and that was actually exactly what this project is about because we're expo exploring these boundaries. Now, secondly, there's human distraction. The first generations of self-driving cars will require us to pay attention such that we can uh, take back control whenever needed. But humans, well, we aren't particularly good at that because as soon as things seem to go well, we easily get distracted, we look at our phones, do something else, and forget about our duties. So in fact, this could even make uh, traffic less safe in the short term rather than safer. An interesting challenge. Third is ethics, and ethics is an aspect that I personally like a lot, so I, I, I'm, I'm going to explain it into a bit more depth with you. And to do so, I want to illustrate it with a, a little example, and I want to take you into a small thought experiment. So please imagine now that you're driving a car together with a friend, and you're driving behind a truck that's transporting a van. But suddenly, the van starts to roll off, and you need to quickly respond. Now, for the sake of this example, you have all the time to decide what's the best decision, as if you had some supercomputer skills. And these same supercomputer skills you use to see that the, red, uh, the right motorcyclist is actually not wearing a helmet. So you need to choose now. <laughs> swerve right or swerve left. If you would go to the left, we would minimize the overall harm expectation. But at the same time, you would be penalizing someone for his responsible behavior. Now let's go on with another example. Choose between hitting a family of three <laughs> or two elderly. <laughs> if you take it bluntly, you could say three against two. But if you look closer, I'm not sure if you noticed already, but there are traffic lights. And the elderly are actually having a green light, but the family has ignored the red light, making it quite a bit more complex, I would say. Last example. No more traffic lights, but four elderly against a family of three. Can you say here, four against three outweighs, or is it maybe different? And these are morally very heavy questions. I think chances are fair that the person next to you in this audience does not even share the same opinion on all of those as you do. So, we need to decide in such, a, such situations what the car should do. In other words, what choices do we want to program in the, uh, the car's computer? And then, who should even decide about that? Me as a programmer? Or lawmakers? Or maybe the car makers? And how are we even going to verify that? Because we learned from Dieselgate that it's already challenging to verify car emissions. So, you might notice that at this point I'm asking way more questions than I'm giving answers, and that's because, honestly, I don't know the answers as well. Actually, the Weeples project didn't help me much closer to getting to an answer, because, in part, that's also because we don't have the right quality of knowledge available to the computers yet. They simply can't have this detail. Not yet. But by the time it becomes applicable, we as a society should make sure that we have our choices ready. And I think it's a discussion that should be held in a broader, multidisciplinary discussion supported by society. Now, let's look ahead to the brighter future. Forget about these dilemmas and join me in one more thought experiment. What if we could change everything overnight? How would the future look like? What would you think? I would say that 
lanes can be much smaller, cars would follow each other much more closer, cars can drive much faster without anyone ever getting a speeding ticket, and cars will simply follow their lane using little magnets in the road. So we don't need any uh, lane markings anymore, any road markings. No street lights are needed anymore, and we won't need traffic lights, traffic signs. If a car enters an intersection, the intersection will tell the car when it's his turn. And things can get as efficient as this. <laughs> and what about our cities? Our cities can become much more livable. Because cars don't need to be parked in town anymore, they can park themselves outside of town. So, no more street parking, loads of extra space for pedestrians and people and children to play. And parking lots can be turned into parks, or maybe a playground for our children. Quite a bright future, right? So when will we get to this future? Well, a magic number these days seems to be 2020. Every car maker has announced to re release some sort of self-driving car by the year 2020. Just Google it, and you'll find loads of results on this topic. But is 2020 realistic? Well, honestly, I think that covering the first 90% of functionality will turn out to be relatively easy, but the last bits will turn out to be very challenging, and they can take a long time, actually. But even if we don't get fully autonomous cars by 2020, which I actually don't think is realistic, we will get some very useful applications already by then. And to make it a success, we as a society, together with technology, need to team up such that we can together push forward the boundaries of self-driving. Thank you for your attention.